music and uh, Pastor David. He just, he's got it. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. It's in him. Yeah, it's great to see. And we see. I had that, you know, to, to wow up the people. Uh, that's not one of my gifts, but uh, I suppose that's, I can work on that as well. You know, we're um, continuing our series on uh, Proverbs 31. And this is the last chapter. And within this Proverbs 31, uh, Proverbs, uh, the book of Proverbs we've been studying for almost the entire year, this particular one is going to have a three, uh, uh, seri- uh, three parts within that particular chapter uh, uh, 31. We did it last time, and uh, last time being about three weeks ago, we want to just continue the, with the second part. But before we can do that, I just want to make one announcement. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, uh, our church... Uh, the leadership and the pastors are going to go to a retreat for an entire Saturday. Uh, so I just want you to uh, ask for prayers for that um, so that we can continue to unite together as one uh, in him. And also uh, those who really want to just uh, hang out with us. And uh, it's a lot of fun. There's, there's music like guys like David is going to sing music and things like that. If you want to really hang out with us. Uh, you're uh, welcome to come see us, and uh, we'll find, uh, hopefully we'll find a spot for you. Growing up, I, talking about music, I knew music wasn't in me, and I also knew that I, the art wasn't in me either. So <clears throat> I didn't really like art class, because I, it's you know, this is art. It's like, what is that? You know, just crayons and like doesn't have any meaning. So when I got a teenager, I go to uh, uh, some guests will come and I have to escort them to a museum, like art museum. I'm really bored. You know, it's like I don't like shopping. When I go to shopping, and like within first twenty minutes, my my knees get sore. I don't know why. You know, but if, any other place, it's fine. But only when I go to shopping. <laughs> And uh, go to a museum is something like that. It's like within 15 minutes, my knees are hurting, and I want to sit down. I don't want to do anything. It's, that's how I grew up about art. I didn't really have the appreciation uh, for art. But to me, it was more about like science. It was more about engineering, which equate to later on architecture. Something that is more like a tangible. Something that when you graduate from college, you can get a decent job. You know, <laughs> I was very practical. You know, art and music. You know, what do you do with this? You know, like, keep it to yourself, kind of thing. And uh, I just didn't have much appreciation. And I, as growing up, I really did. You know, understand the importance of art and music because that's what we do. At first, you know, uh, half of our worship is all about music. You know, and we're trying to introduce art as well, you know. Actually, we haven't really done so. But about, as you remember, about a couple of weeks ago, I had to go down to Miami uh, to visit my Miami office. I haven't been there for almost six months. And there's some things were going on. I had to go and, uh, and spend some time down there also, uh, be able to tour, give a sort of more like a tour guide for some of the clients from the Northeast, uh, like Fort Lee and Rahway, New Jersey. They're all coming down. To, they want to see what we have developed down there. And I had a great time to be able to uh, visit one of the big, huge church in Fort Lauderdale. And that was a blessing as well. But when I went there uh, and trying to show them what we have accomplished down there in terms of design, and I was showing this and realized, wow, I can't believe the foundation of what was done down in Miami, it was about art and music. And I'm living off from the people who had so much passion for art. If you look at this slide, upper left corner, it was one of those areas in Miami. It was very desolate. It was a rundown. It's the kind of place nobody wanted to go, like even just 10, 15, 20 years ago. It was like kind of place like, oh, don't go there after dusk. It's the kind of place you don't go. And it's just totally, and then the artists had a, because they're, artists are poor, right? And most of them are poor that I know, <laughs> okay? So they had this amazing vision and a passion. Maybe we can do something with this. Something that people with the science and engineering says, like, no, I cannot do anything with that. That's, that's, that's a bad place. It's not tangible. 
So I didn't do anything with it. But this artist come along. I think we could do something. And then they created this uh, upper, uh, you know, three pictures with uh, with art. They started probably what we would call graffiti, this doodling or some kind of putting cartoons on the walls of these stores that are really run down. Guess what happened? It's like you know, bees and butterflies. People begin to come. Before nobody came, when they put this art, the people began to come and just look at things. And more artists will come and paint. And they come and paint. And then as, as more people came, these little tiny stores began to open up. Pizza stores and things like that began to, store, began to happen. And then 15 years later, today, that's what happened. That little thing there with a with a book minister fuller design, but we call it a soccer ball. Right below the soccer ball, there's like 200, 500 parking spaces that we kind of designed. And people gather there, they have fun, there's stores there, and then all of a sudden it became, became so successful. Now those people, people who are studying engineering and architecture cannot even afford. There's people who are practical, cannot even afford Louis Vuitton. I have never bought anything from there. But you walk in there, it's like, Wow, it's just shocked, you know. But from that little junk into something like that, art became a catalyst for attraction. Art became a catalyst for igniting with the people. Art became a catalyst for development. It's just totally amazing. And the street began to just activate with people became a whole new place. This poor artist, poor artist with a vision, with a calling, and they turn the junk into something amazing that people can marvel at, the new creation, new thing. The point I'm trying to make is this. God can do the same for you. God can do the same for you. See, when you are in Christ, you know, when Christ is in you, when the Holy Spirit is in you, it's like having an art in you. Sometimes it feels like very poor. Like, what can he do for me? He doesn't, I can't even touch him when he's in me. It's like a, a music in you. You can't really, you can't really touch music. Yeah, your music uh, ability is so, so, no one's really want to hear your voice. It's not that great yet. It hasn't been known yet. But you could turn that. You can turn that, just like the artist did with that place. We can t- you can turn your life into something that attracts people, something that ignites with one another. another. You can create something like that. Think about it. Those what does the artists do? They collect the junk and they look at it. They, they begin to visualize how can I turn this junk into something special, something spectacular. That's what they do. That's what they do. And God does the same thing. We're all junk, you see. We're all junk. We're just, just old, beat up. It's something that people don't want. But God is looking at us and says, hey, you, hey, you, let me see what I can do. All I need to is infuse with the power of the Holy Spirit in you, and you accept Him, and you're ready to uh, transform. I can do something with it. I can transform you. I can, you can change you. And all the problems that we have, all the challenges that we have, it is a seed for the flower for tomorrow. And the Bible in the uh, Ephesians says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act. In order to fulfill what? His, God's good purpose for you. Now, when you are not, you don't have music in you, and you don't have art in you, and you don't have a cross in you, it's like this doesn't really mean anything. But once you have a music in you, once you have an art in you, once you have a Christ in you, yes, it begins to uh, evolve into something that the God is now going to do something with that art, with the music, with the Christ, His Son that is in you. That's a transformation that we are talking about. Then the question is, how do I show this? They, 
the design district in Miami, they showcase with these beautiful streets and landscapes and, 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 and the buildings and, and the stores. How can we demonstrate that change in us? It's called testimony. It's called testimony. Most of us, when we have junk in our hearts, junk that you don't want, we don't want to reveal that. You see, artists, what I learned is they love to reveal their junk that they have in their garage. <laughs> it's just the way it is. And they bring it out. They say, here's, my, no, I, don't, I can't use the Bible for that. Here's my junk. Okay, I use my iPhone. It's a junk. It's a, it's a junk. Look at this. Take a look at this. I ain't going to transform this. I'm going to change it. Once I put some little color, once I put something, this is going to be all of a sudden, this rich, rich people are going to think that this is worth something. They want to buy it. They can change it. They can change it. But how can we do this? We can't do it physically. But when God is in us, we do that with testimonies. You know the hurts that you have? And oftentimes, uh, when I have hurts, I openly talk about it. The ridicules and, and the mockery that I, that I faced uh, and when I was growing up in the leprosy colony, and back in the 60s, when, you know, it's, it's okay to talk about it, I suppose, and the, in the country was, uh, this country was pretty, pretty uh, challenging as, as uh, foreigners uh, uh, coming and living in this society. It's very challenging, a lot of discrimination there in those days. Okay. I talk about it openly because that, that's, that's like junk in my life. You know? But by talking about it, by testifying, you can begin to create something good with it. People begin to look at it, wow. Not only that you are transparent, but being able to show the junk and that you can show them it has been transformed into something that is worth having worth hearing, worth receiving. Proverbs 31, the woman of a noble character. Simply, she is not anybody special. She was an ordinary woman turned into extraordinary woman. That's what it is. Woman of noble character. Everybody is born in exactly the same way. Some collect a lot more junk in their lives. I have a plant of junk in my, in my garage, in, my, in the brain garage here, in my hard garage. Got a lot in there. You just turn that into an extraordinary uh, ways by beginning to revealing it as you, as, as you have Christ in you, it's just like as you have an art and music in you, when you have a, some of the little musicians, they have a couple little, you know, and they use that in, to, in order to make something with it. The difference for this woman of noble character is that she stuck to Simple values in life. Once she received, once she agreed, decided to follow God, the Holy Spirit, she decided these are the core values I am just going to apply to my junk. You know, when, you have, when we have a lot of junk in our lives, we don't know how to use crayons to create something new. We bury all those things. We bury the music in our life. We bury our, our colors in our life. We just look at our junk and say, oh, that's a filthy. That's what can they do? It's just dragging me, dragging my life. Woman of noble character, it's not somebody like amazing. She wasn't born that way. She had a simple values and said, I am just going to stick with it. And those values are all described in Proverbs 31 from verse 10 through 
31st that we have studied. In summary, in summary, that we talked about it, in summary is that she learned to live a life, not for herself, but she lived, learned to live a life where she can say, my, your life, your neighbor's life, your life is my business. It's not that your business is my life. I'm not after your business. I'm not just interested in your business. Anybody can do that. But because I have a Christ in me, because I have art in me, because I have music in me, I am more interested in your life. Yeah, business is nice, but I'm more interested in your life. That's how she ran her life. That's how she ran her business. And that's what's depicted in Proverbs 31 as to how to live with the simple values that God will say, I like that woman. I'm going to continue to give her favor. And that's what happens. That's what happens. And the challenge that we talked about as, as a church and as a believers moving forward is to, for us to do just that. Live out the simple values that God has commanded us in a workplace, in a, in a profession, in a school. And that's something that we as a, as a church are together working on. I'm just so thrilled. So woman of noble character is, uh, in a verse, te- uh, verse 10, um, it's, it's all of us. It's not the woman of noble character, as I mentioned before, that Jesus is groom and we are bride. And because we are married, Jesus is husband, we become wife. So it actually, depending on the translation, is sometimes a woman of noble character. Another translation is a wife of noble character. So therefore, when it's a wife of noble character, it's not more easier to understand that this chapter 31 isn't just for female, it's for all of us as believers in Christ. We, become, we are the wife, we are the bride of Christ, so therefore it applies to all of us. So we went, went through different uh, verse 11, 12, and 13, and 14, and so forth, uh, I just want to just touch base on uh, what they are so you can remember. Verse 11 says, Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing in value. That's the value. That's the color. That's the music that she uh, played all the time to her to his life. Make, she want to make sure that her husband, her partner, her, her God that she serves has full confidence in in her, lacking nothing of value. That means you have to strive for to satisfy that satisfaction uh, to, in, in an effort to make uh, to satisfy your partner, your business people, your client, your family, your mother, your children. It comes from loving your neighbor as yourself. But th- that's the with underlying. That's the overarching theme. That's what it takes in order to do, in order to carry out the simple, simple uh, core values of, 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 of life. Verse 12, she brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Just think about that. Just think about that. How often do you take your wallet out and you're paying a company or stores, you're giving them money, but they're giving you a hard time instead. It happens a lot, more than you think. You get very upset. I even, I'm not going to get into detail. I even experienced it like yesterday. The guy is the host of whatever. I can't really talk about it, but he's, he's giving me a hard time. He's getting paid, but he's giving me a hard time. How often do we end up doing it? When you truly love your neighbor as yourself, how can we harm somebody? Just because the person did not live up to your expectation, she brings him good, not harm. When? Just a few times? Just when they are living up to the contract? No, all the days of her life. 
Verse 15, she gets up early while it is still dark. Be diligent. Get up early in the morning. I used to be pretty good at this. And I don't know why. Lately, I like to sleep in a little bit. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. She provides food for her family and portion for her servant girls. Take care of your employee. Take care of your co-worker. And that's what's, what's in the Bible. And that's where we left off last time. And uh, today we're just going to continue with the verse 16. 16 says, she considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. You go to shopping, you look at things, look at different things, this clothing, that you're considering it, and you're buying it. How often do we buy it even though you don't have the money? This Bible verse says, don't do that. Use your own earned money to do it. Now, credit card, people ask me often, what about the credit card? If this is your credit card, you earn the credit, I think it's okay. Because in those days, they didn't have credit cards. The monetary system was a little different. So I think it's okay. But those who don't have a credit card, who says, Mom, Dad, how can I get my, my I don't know, Juliana and Christina, when they were like teenagers, like seven years old, went to Mom and said, Mom, how can I get one of those credit cards? This is why. Well, it looks like every time you have that, they give you something. You know, it's, but it says, it says uh, out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. When you're investing something, when you're buying something, you, know, you use your own money. So, well, I want to buy the house, but I don't have the money. So you go to uncle's uncle. You, hey, rich uncle, can you give me $50,000 so I can buy my, this house? Oh, rich uncle, I'm starting my business. Can you give me some $50,000 from down payment or initial payment, startup? This Bible verse to me says, don't do it. Because why do we say that is because if, if you stick with the values that God is teaching you, God's promise is that I'll take care of you. Even though you may start humble, even though you may start very small, you're going to accelerate far more. I see it to it that you're going to accelerate far more. That humble heart is going to carry you, not only with God, but the people around you. And then I mentioned this so many times when I started my own business 21 years ago, after heart transplant, with a new conviction, with a new vision, new calling. I didn't have any money, I realized. I had to sell everything that I had to, so that I can pay for my medicine. Where's my medicine? I didn't bring my medicine today. It's $1,500 a month I have to pay for it. So I had absolutely no money. But I want to start a business. I didn't use all my money at all because I didn't have any money. I put my house on the market, but it wouldn't sell. The economy was bad. I know some of you have already heard me talk about it just for a few people who have not heard about how I started my business. So I started trying to start my business, and that's an architectural engineering design firm. I didn't have any money, so uh, my uh, younger brother heard that I wanted to start a business. He was a student, and he calls me up and said, Tim, what does it take to start a business for you? Because... If I become a doctor later, graduate from school and become a, a doctor, if I want to start my clinic, it's going to cost me at least like $200,000, even a quarter million dollars, because I have to have a, a, a space, I have to hire a nurse, I have to hire administrators, and a lot of paperwork goes with it. All this seats that we have to hire for, for patients, and I can't get it from Ikea. I mean, those seats has you know, all this... Uh, uh, incline, decline, all that. I like ten, twenty thousand dollars, just for one. All this stuff that I have to get, it's very, very expensive. It's going to cost at least like two hundred thousand minimum. He said, "Well, for me, I can do it at home, so I don't need to have a rent. Um, 
And um, I don't need those chairs. I can use chairs from Ikea or the ones they already have. So what I need is one simple little computer. Costing me three, well, cost at that time $3,000. Today you can get it for like $1,500, $3,000. Oh, that's all? Okay. So with that, I was still struggling. I just couldn't, st- I didn't have enough money to buy the $3,000 computer. So about a month later, I opened the door, my house door, and there was the three boxes. One monitor, in those days, they didn't have a flat screen. It was really huge, you know. One monitor in the one box, and the one processor. Those days, processors were big, really heavy. Remember that? You can't even carry this really heavy, really big processor. And then there was accessories, you know, keyboards and all that kind of stuff, wires. So with that, we said, well, we'll open the door. We'll open the business. And uh, even though I did not use my <laughs> own money, but it was a, a gift that I received. With that, we started. And, and here we are. I remember also prior to that, prior to that, I getting sick for the hospital, uh, my wife and I uh, risk, and we bought the house that we're living in right now. It was way beyond our ability. And if I had read this Bible verse, if I understood this Bible verse, I wouldn't even have attempted to buy it. But I was determined to get that house. So I applied for the, 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 the bank, says, no, you don't qualify. Then apply to another bank. No, you don't qualify. And apply to another bank. No, you don't qualify. And I kept at it. And pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope. And uh, somehow uh, I did end up buying that house. And from the day that I bought a house, within this, it was nightmare what we had to go through. And then we were faced with a heart transplant surgery, and it was very, very difficult. And God gave me the lesson. God gave me the lesson. Use your own earned money, earned credit to get things done. That's when God is going to be blessing you, not borrowing money from uh, others that when you do not qualify. Verse 17, she sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sets about her work vigorously. Think about this. Back several thousand years ago, when they had technically servants or slaves, she was business owner, but she set her work vigorously. She worked diligently. She worked hard. If you see some of the movies from the, you know, two, three, four, five hundred years ago, these masters they never worked. They sit there like this, and all the servants do all the work. That's not very biblical according, according to this Bible verse. So when I was starting my own firm, I had to make sure that I become also like, just like them. Physically, mentally, I work alongside with them. And then all these employees get the, wow, my boss is doing the same kind of work. And they get, they're more, they're more, more, they're more willing to go the extra mile that we seek. Her arms are strong for her tasks. In those days, they didn't have any computer. It was all, most of the work and most of the business in those days are laborers. Her arms are strong when she actually did heavy lifting. Look at all these uh, movies from the past. You know, these owners who just wear this beautiful and wonderful dress, and, and uh, they don't do any hard work. So therefore, they don't have any muscle. They didn't have any, they didn't have any elephants. I bet underneath all that beautiful dress, they're probably like, they're just like me right now. It's like no, no muscle, no nothing. They're, you know, that's just, just blah, you know. But her arms are strong for her tasks. That means she was actually digging. She was actually doing the work along with the co-workers. That's where the uh, synergy comes. That's where unity comes. That's when everything uh, can work together for, for its own good. In verse uh, 18, she sees that her trading is profitable. It's perfectly okay to make money. That's according to the Bible says. Go make some money. You know, I will make sure, God said, I'll make sure you, your business, your life is profitable. And her lamp does not go out at night. You can interpret it in two ways. One is that she is a like workaholic. 
So she works until midnight, beyond one, two o'clock. The, her lamp is always morning, we're studying or whether it's working. That's one interpretation that, uh, that this can give. Second interpretation of this is this, because she made so uh, decent profit, she always has enough reserve. She always has enough oil that she can continue to keep that lamp burning. Remember those days? The oil is expensive today, but the wax and, uh, back in those days were pretty expensive too. You turn them off, but her lamp does not go out at night. And lastly, this is where my company mission team comes from. We exist to help those who are in need. Our church mission and vision statement is transforming our lives in Christ to serve others. Verse 20 says, she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Verse before that, God says, go make profit. I'll help you. If you do this way, I'll have a favor upon you. I'll see to it that you make some profits out there. And once you have the profit, use that money to help the poor. See, that's the overarching purpose of our life. That's the reason for our should be for our existence. If the money is should be just a tool, not a goal unto itself. It should be a tool. And all this comes from this overarching command from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you read this Bible verse, especially New Testament, it's repeated in different verses so many times. Saying there's so many commands, so many prophecies in this that we study all the time. But you really need to know only two things. Or if you are, if, if we were to summarize this, everything that's in here, if you summarize this, is down to two. Number one is love your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, which we all do. Number two is love your neighbor as yourself. Too often, too often, we love the Lord so much, but we forget about the second love. And if we do the first love and the second love together, then God would say, I am pleased with you. And he will continue to pour favor upon you. And when you do that, and you receive some of the favors, and you see that God is walking in your life, and you have some victories in your life, all of a sudden, there's a little art in your body. There also there's music in you. And then all of a sudden, you realize, ah, it was the Christ in me is helping to do this. Christ, the Holy Spirit that dwells in me, is making this to happen. Thus, you can translate the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit into music, into art, into adoration for our God, and thus fulfilling what he has commanded us to do. So I pray that you would have some art in your life, have some music, not because you are born with the music, not because you have natural ability and talent for music. Even though you can't really sing that well, you can still have music. In fact, people cannot speak or sing that good. They can still have even better music that through our emotions and with our face expressions, with just simple humming, could be very, very contagious and joyful, can be uplifting to many, many around us. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He brought us what? art and music through his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for what you're doing.